Welcome to Machu Picchu, everybody. This is the Indigenous Americas unit, so unit number five. Uh, you're looking at a piece by the Incan Empire uh, about probably like a three day walking distance from the capital of Cusco. Let me get rid of that. Uh, the capital of Cusco. And this was considered to be really like a royal estate for the first Incan emperor, um, Pachacuti. And you would hold feasts there, perform religious ceremonies. Uh, he would rule from this site. And it is this royal retreat in the midst of the Andes Mountains, which will become definitely significant, which you're seeing here in these two really beautiful images of Machu Picchu. Um, the mountains around, the Andes Mountains around Machu Picchu were considered to be ancestral deities. So the emperor and those who lived here with him were just surrounded continually by the ancestors. And if you guys remember, you know, back in, oh gosh, you know, the earliest pieces we were doing at the beginnings of civilization with the ziggurat and temple of Ur, you, even the pyramids and the Acropolis from the Greek era, you put your sacred sites up high uh, to get closer to the gods. It associates you more with the gods and gets you closer to their power and their influence and you know, their presence. Uh, and so this, I think, goes along with that, certainly. Um, plus the weather was nice, you know, too. And so they're trying to get away from some of the weather in Cusco as well. And I put in the image uh, a map. So you can kind of see the floor plan, although this is not a college board image. You can see the separation. There's a clear separation here between what is the basic farming area of Machu Picchu, which I will show you their um, typical terraced garden gardening uh, techniques, which we talked a little bit about with Maze Cobb. And then the residential ceremonial complex here, and that's all separated by kind of this uh, plaza square. And so this will give you some of the ideas. You can kind of take a look at that. Um, you've got the Inti Tuawana stone, Ooh, sorry, pronunciation, terrible. And uh, the observatory, royal residences around this area, factory areas and kind of more, um, uh, places of um, industry and kind of maintenance of the whole city uh, there as well. And you can see the river, the Urubamba River, where uh, below that it was located near. Uh, but here is kind of a look at the ruins of the complex and some of the structures made of stone that you're seeing a little bit of a view of the terraced gardens which you can see over here as well uh, so there was a farming area to machu picchu clearly and that would sustain the emperor and the people who lived here uh, and then there's also the residential areas ceremonial areas as well and i'd probably guess around 700 plus people lived here uh, and even when the emperor left to go live in Cusco for the remainder of the year, you'd still have a maintenance staff here and others who were from all over the empire. And, and really, they were forced to live here by the emperor. So you can kind of see through that and through the diversity of the people from all over the Incan empire, just the true power of Pachacuti and you know to, to make them leave their um, you know, homes and come here and live and work in this really isolated remote uh, city of Machu Picchu. So um, that's an interesting part of the power equation here for the emperor uh, to have these people live there from, uh, for most of the year. Oh, here's a great look at the terraced farming, the Andes mountains around or the ancestral deities. Uh, and here also is that pretty uh, typical, and I don't think we talked about this with the last piece of Incan architecture, which was uh, the Cori Concha, the trapezoid shaped windows or doorways is very classic Incan architecture. 
And you also see the stonework here that is typical of the Incans, where you have varied stones and they're, they're shaped in order to fit right next to the stone that's already placed. So you'll have varied sizes and varied shapes. Um, this is a little less extreme than like you saw in Sasko uh, Wamza, uh, but it's pretty uh, typical of their architecture. Now, two main structures within Machu Picchu you will have to know. One of them is the observatory. Now the observatory is sometimes called the Temple of the Sun. Uh, there are two kind of stories to it. There's an upper level and a more underground or lower level, lower story to it as well. It's located directly next to the emperor's living quarters. Uh, so Pachacuti could come out and um, basically track the constellations, they used it to calculate the summer solstice, so the solstice and the, the location of the sun in June. And it really reinforced this idea. And again, here is that observatory right here. Here's a look at it from, you know, kind of further away, looking straight at the facade. Um, it reinforced the idea that the emperor was the descendant of the sun. And remember, the Incans believe that they are descendant from the sun god Inti. So it, it helped with him right next door. It really reinforced his particular association with the sun god. And it was convenient as well. You know, wake up during the day, get out right next door. You're performing your, your rituals. So it was a convenience factor too. But, but most importantly, it was a visual association of the emperor with the sun, the sun god Inti. Remember, that's I-N-T-I. And then the other part of the Machu Picchu complex, which is incredibly important, is the Intihuatana stone. And it's a six foot carved stone. Here you see it uh, from further away with the mountains. And this is another great view about it with people there and the Andes Mountains behind it. But the Intihuatana stone is a ceremonial sundial. And basically it translates to the hitching post of the sun. You know, imagine the horse being tied to a hitching post back in the West. You know, instead of a horse, you're kind of lassoing the sun in its particular position during the winter solstice. So as the observatory was the more summer solstice, the Intihuatana stone is more of the winter solstice marker and had four sides to it, the stone itself, uh, carved maybe to suggest the four compass points, you know, north, south, east, west. Uh, it really was a marker of really the most a sacred time, an important time, and again, something to connect the Incan people and particularly the emperor to the sun and for farming people as well, you know, like Stonehenge, it's important to know the summer and winter solstices so you can plan out your farming uh, very specifically with that. Now, coming back to the look of Machu Picchu here, the whole scene, um, it was built around the 1400s, maybe in the middle of the 15th century, so mid 1400s, and then abandoned in the middle of the 1500s. And remember about 1530-ish, the Spanish come in and conquer Cusco. And so we think it was abandoned around that time. Um, perhaps they were having a water shortage also. But uh, no one, none of the Spanish had found Machu Picchu. It wasn't discovered till about 1911 with a Yale professor uh, discovered the site and took a lot of the artifacts because it was undisturbed. So they found burial sites with you know, human remains, artifacts, pottery, and they took it all back to Yale University. And it had been and possibly still is a source of contention. Peru and Yale in particular, you have a lot of artifacts there that belonged um, in Machu Picchu, which of course the Peruvians want back. So uh, again, that is the city of Machu Picchu. 
a place uh, for ritual, for feasts, religious ceremonies, uh, a place where the elite lived, maintenance staff. Um, they had religious shrines, great water drainage, terraced landscape for farming that was typical for uh, the Incans. And, you know, it's a great reflection of their typical architectural style with the cutting of that stone to fit in with each other. Um, just a really spectacular, remote, beautiful uh, site that they believed connected them to the ancestral deities in their culture. All right. Hope that helped and take care and we'll see you in the next piece.